All right, everybody, uh, let's go ahead and get started. We'll kind of ease into this slowly. Welcome everybody to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens and you're in the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Tonight, we're gonna talk about another sutta, also from the Majima Nikaya. Um, if you've been coming to Dharma Doors, if you've, if you've been following along, we are gonna skip sutta number 67. Uh, I read through it, and it's one of those suttas that, well, it's very specific to monastics. And not only that, it's one of those suttas where the Buddha is speaking specifically to a little group of male monastics. And so his advice is very specific to male renunciants. And since I figured that's a you know a, a small audience out there, I'm not going to do that sutta. <laughs> but I am going to do tonight sutta number sixty eight. This uh, Nalakapana sutta. Uh, Nalakapana is a place. Uh, it is sort of um, well. Actually, let me grab it. I totally forgot to grab it. I've been getting much more into Buddhist geography, like the specific geography. And so you can see here the, the region of Kosala. And that is in relationship to, let's say, like, well, a lot of the suttas take place at Sabati, right? And here's Rajgriha, another place. This is Bodhgaya, where the Buddha was enlightened. But up here near Savati, where most of the suttas take place, there's a region called Kosala, and that's where we're going to be tonight. So a little north of Savati uh, in Nalakapanna. Now, I was very excited to find this sutta. In many ways, I feel like I've been looking for this sutta for a long time. Um, I'll explain why as we kind of go through it, but... There's a there's a lot of good information in this sutta, and there's, of course, a lot of good dharma. But there's also just a lot of interesting sort of, like, I would put it as context to a lot of ideas that you're familiar with. It's ideas that I have been familiar with. But this is going to actually kind of contextualize a lot of things. So... It's like a lot of the suttas we've been reading lately. There's sort of like part one, part two, part three, sort of it's like divided into these sections. So let's go ahead and dive in and we'll start making our way through the beginning of it. So again, this is sutta number 68, the Nalakapana Sutta, the, the teaching given at Nalakapana. Uh, pi page 566, if you happen to have the Wisdom Publication Edition. And here we go. Thus have I heard, on one occasion the Blessed One was living in the Kosalan country of Nalakapanna, in the Palasa Grove. Now, on that occasion, many very well-known clansmen had gone forth out of faith from the home life into homelessness under the Blessed One. The Venerable Anirudha, the Venerable Nandiya, the Venerable Kimbila, the Venerable Bahagu, the Venerable Kundadana, the Venerable Ravata, the Venerable Ananda, and other very well-known clansmen. And on that occasion, the Blessed One was seated in the open, surrounded by the Sangha of Bhikkhus. Then, referring to those new clansmen who had just become renunciants, like Ananda and Anirudha, then, referring to those clansmen, he addressed all the Bhikkhus thus, Bhikkhus! Those clansmen who have gone forth out of faith from the home life into homelessness under me, do they delight in the holy life? When this was said, those bhikkhus were silent. A second and a third time, referring to those clansmen, 
the Buddha addressed the bhikkhus thus, bhikkhus, those clansmen who have gone forth out of a faith from the home life into homelessness under me, do they delight in the, in the holy life? And for a second and a third time, the bhikkhus were all silent. Then the Blessed One considered thus. Suppose I question those clansmen. <laughs> then he addressed the Venerable Anirudha, saying, Anirudha, do you all delight in the holy life? And Anirudha replied, Surely, Venerable Sir, we delight in the holy life. All right, so before we get into that, I want to, there's one term, the holy life, that I want to clarify. I want to kind of, it's what the first part of the sutta is about. It's this question that the Buddha is interested in among the newly, the newly joined monastics. And it's, the question is, Abhiratta Brahmacharya? Abhirati. Abhirati is a word, rati just by itself means sort of like playfulness, fun, amusement. And abhirati is like a lot of amusement, like super fun. But the idea is it's about pl pl pleasing. Is it fun? Is it enjoyable? But the question that the Buddha is asking is, is, is brahmacharya delightful to you? So the word that's being translated as the holy life, and in other translations, it has a bunch of different ways of being translated. But I want you to, you know, we need, this is a word we need to kind of discuss because of where this is going for the rest of the sutta. So brahmacharya is this it's a word, it's a term, and you find it a lot in Buddhism. It uh, Most translators will not like translate it, or I mean, they will translate it some weird way. But what we need to know is, is that first, this is not a strictly Buddhist term. It's a very uh, pan-Indian term. The Buddhists use it, and what it refers to is the charya and chara means like work, cultivation, practice, doing something. And this is the work or the practice or the cultivation of Brahma. And so the Brahma charya is a word that's about having a kind of cultivation or practice that's in relationship with the god brahma and the thing that we need to re always remember when we're talking about brahma we need to remember that brahma is the god of the realm of form and the realm of form the realm the rupa datu we need to remember that that's the realm of the meditator that's the realm of jhana. In fact, if you're in a jhana, a jhanic state or in a jhana, you are in the realm of form. Like that's what it means. And so the idea here is, is that there's a word for people who are interested in basically being always in the realm of Brahma, meaning outside of the kama datu the realm of desire. Remember, that's the realm of chakra indra. That's the realm of reproduction, the realm of sexuality, the realm of sensuality, the realm of kama. Now, the thing about it is, is that if you kind of start looking into this word brahmacharya, it becomes like it denotes celibacy. And a lot of times the word brahmacharya is translated as celibacy. Now, remember what I just said, which is that the realm of form is not the realm of desire. The realm of desire is the realm of reproduction, meaning sexual reproduction. And so the idea here is, is that 
brahmacharians, practitioners of this brahmacharya practice, because they're not, they're trying not to have a relationship with the kamadhatu, sexuality is the kamadhatu. So it kind of makes sense that some groups translate brahmacharya as being exclusively sort of about celibacy. But here, for tonight and going forward, I think that it's probably much better to be thinking about brahmacharya as what we would call asceticism. The basic idea is that to be an ascetic, it, it means that you are removing yourself from sensual pleasures. You are removing yourself from the world in a lot of different ways. Like that's what an, an, an ascetic is, right? Well, a brahmacharyan is basically asceticism in that way. But the reason why I wanted to take a moment to talk about the actual language that's being used in the text the question is, are you enjoying brahmacharya? The reason why I wanted to make that clear about what they're referring to is because we kind of, or I, I would like you to remember that the Buddha or Buddhism is moving us away from pleasure that's dependent upon things. Right? I talk about this a lot in Dharma doors or just my Dharma talks. And it's a certain kind of pleasure that comes from things versus a kind of pleasure that comes from not needing anything, from being totally independent and sovereign of everything. That type of freedom, the joy of that, is way more enjoyable than dependent pleasures that can be taken away from you at any moment and make you sad. So my point is, is that there's an important question here when the Buddha's like, are you enjoying not having sensual pleasures? Are you, are you enjoying brahmacharya? So I needed to make that really clear as we move forward. Everybody good with brahmacharya? Cool. It'll, it'll make this next part even more interesting, I think. So Anirudha, having in a way recently converted along with Ananda and the others, he says, surely, venerable sir, we delight in brahmacharya. We delight in the holy life. Good, good, Anirudha, the Buddha says. It is proper for all you clansmen who have gone forth out of faith from the home life into homelessness, homelessness, it's imperative that you delight in the holy life. As you are still endowed with the blessings of youth, black-haired young men in the prime of life, you could have indulged in sensual pleasures, yet you have gone forth from the home life into homelessness. It's not because you've been driven by kings that you've gone forth from the home life into homelessness, or because you've been driven by thieves, or you owe a debt, or out of fear, or a want of a livelihood. Rather, did you not go forth out of faith from the home life into homelessness after you considered thus? I'm a victim of birth and death. I'm a victim of aging, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. I'm a victim of suffering. I pray to suffering, I, or I am prey to suffering. Surely an ending of this whole mass of suffering can be known. Anirudha agreed and said, yes, <clears throat> that's what I was thinking when I left the household life. And what should be done, Anirudha, by a clansman who has gone forth thus? Well, while they still do not attain 
to the rapture and pleasure that are secluded from sensual pleasures and secluded from unwholesome states, or to something even more peaceful than that. So if they're not meditating right, and they're not getting into a nice jhanic state, in other words, covetousness invades their mind and remains. Ill will invades the mind and remains. Sloth and torpor invade the mind and remain. Restlessness and worry inv invade the mind and remain. Doubt invades the mind and remains. Discontent invades the mind and remains. Weariness invades the mind and remains. That is so, while, while one still does not attain to the rapture and pleasure that are secluded from sensual pleasures and secluded from unwholesome states, or to something even more peaceful than that. But when one attains a jhanic state, so when one attains to the rapture and pleasure that are secluded from sensual pleasures and secluded from unwholesome states, or to something even more peaceful than that, covetousness does not invade the mind and remain. Ill will does not invade the mind and remain. Sloth and torpor does not invade the mind and remain. Restlessness and worry does not invade the mind and remain. Doubt does not invade the mind and remain. Discontent does not invade the mind and remain. And weariness does not invade the mind and remain. This is so when one attains to the rapture and pleasure that are secluded from sensual pleasures and secluded from unwholesome states, or to something even more peaceful than that. All right, let's talk about that section now real quick. The language is kind of a little weird in that way, but I hope everybody kind of gets what the Buddha is talking about. So he's talking about these new, you know, these new monks, these new people who have gone forth from the home life into homelessness. And the Buddha is talking about enjoying that removal from the world. He's talking about enjoying the seclusion and all of that. Like that's what the sutra is kind of about, in enjoying the holy life in that way. And so what he's saying, or at least the way that I read the sutta, is after talking to Anirudha about, yeah, you, you guys should be enjoying this. <laughs> like, this should be pleasurable. This should not be, uh, you know, like a grind. And so in saying that, where he's like, yeah, you should be enjoying this, then that paragraph is sort of about how you could be enjoying it or not enjoying it. <laughs> And the idea here is, is that it all hinges on this ability to seclude oneself from sensual pleasures and from unwholesome states. We've heard this language a million times now, right? This is what it means to basically get into a jhana, right? Is you are both cultivating morality that's what they mean by seclusion from unwholesome states. So we're not being violent and killing. We're not stealing. We're not lying. We're not intoxicating ourselves. We are not abusing our sexual energy in that way. So we're removed from unwholesome states and secluded from sensual pleasures. This can take the form of actual sens sensory deprivation where you actually remove, like close your eyes, go into a quiet room and actually withdraw from the senses. Or you can just not attend to sensual pleasures in that way. So they're there, but you just don't obsess about them in that sense. But the point is, is that it, you need to do those two things separation from unwholesome states and this, you know, seclusion from sensual pleasures. And if you are successful in doing that and get into a jhana, then these seven hindrances, 
So I don't know if you've caught it, but the first five in this list, which are the covetousness, ill will, sloth and torpor, restlessness and worry and doubt, those are the classic five nivaranya, the classic five hindrances. This sutra, there's two extras added, this idea of discontent and weariness. I actually think this is a great lesson, right? Just this little mini lesson of like not getting too hung up on the lists and basically understanding that the matrika, as they're called, the so the, the lists, by the way, if you've never heard this or haven't heard it from me recently, all these lists, like the Buddha teaching and all these different lists of things, those are actually called matrika. It's literally where we get the English word matrix from. But what's interesting about that word matrix and the Sanskrit word matrika, the root of them is mother, mother. And it's why the lists are often called the mothers of Buddhas. And it's a play on the matrika mother thing. It's a beautiful play. But I want you to understand that all the lists, they come after the Buddha has taught. <laughs> So the Buddha is doing all this teaching and he's just talking about things that mess our mind up, doubt and worry and discontent and this. And then enough times the Buddha teaches and he eventually sort of settles on these five things. And then that becomes the list of the five hindrances. But I just want you to know that there's seven in this one. And we shouldn't freak out about that. <laughs> so on that note, of course, the very, very first of these, the, what's being translated as covetousness is kama. That is that idea of the sensual desire. And again, I really think that like, if you are a Dharma practitioner, if you're a Buddhist in that way, I can't stress this enough that what it, what is called kama, this particular hindrance, but it's also a poison. It's also, uh, you know, it's it's a big problem, kama. I really want you to know that you should like that that particular one. It could be sexuality. And it usually is sexuality, but it could be addiction, addiction to the pleasures of, of drugs and alcohol. It could be whatever, whatever the sensual thing that you cr crave in an unhealthy way, in a way that's detrimental to you. That emotion, though, again, call it addiction, call it lust, whatever. That's the first of these. Again, what is being translated as covetousness. And what we want to notice is that the Buddha is saying like, you know, if you're not cultivating these sorts of withdrawal, and basically if you're not practicing not needing anything in that kind of meditative jhanic way, then you're, you are open to covetousness. And we want to just notice the language. If one is not in a jhana, covetousness invades the mind and remains. So we want to kind of notice this, that we're opening ourselves up to the possibility of covetousness coming in. Or anger, ill will. That's the second of these, right? So sort of the exact opposite of the wanting is the aversion, the get away from me, the anger in that way. And then, of course, the laziness, sloth and torpor, the restlessness and worry, call it anxiety, frankly, and then doubt versus certainty and confidence, as we talk about a lot. 
And then, of course, these last two, discontent and weariness. These are the last two of these hindrances in that way that could invade the mind, but not for one who is cultivating jhana. All right. Everybody good with all of that? Cool. So now we're moving on to this more. This is a sort of now it's going to get juicier in that way. We're kind of past the preliminary stuff. So the Buddha asks Aniruddha an odd question. And it's odd because it's not, it's not true. So it's like, why is he even asking this? But here it is. So the Buddha says, how is it, Aniruddha, that you all think of me this way? The Tathagata has not abandoned the taints that defile, that bring renewal of being, that give trouble, that ripen into suffering, and that lead to future birth, aging, and death. That's why the Tathagata uses one thing after reflecting, endures another thing after reflecting, avoids another thing after reflecting, and removes another thing after reflecting. But Aniruddha says, no, venerable sir, we don't, we don't think that way about the Blessed One. We think of you, we think of the Blessed One. The Tathagata has abandoned the taints that defile and bring renewal of being, give trouble, ripen into suffering, and lead to future birth, aging, and death. That's why the Tathagata uses one thing after reflecting, endures another thing after reflecting, avoids another thing after reflecting, and removes another thing after reflecting. And the Buddha is going to say, good, good, that's right. <laughs> But let's talk about what's kind of going on in there. So for the kind of the rest of tonight, for the sutta, we're going to have to do a quick, quick review of the uh, ashrava, the taints. This, this sutta sort of starts to become about the taints in that way. So... We want to remember, and this is going to go back many, many, actually, this is going to go all the way back to the sutta number two, which is called uh, Sarvasava, all the taints. And it's in that that gives the clear description. But let's remember that the taints, as they're called, those are these particular mental problems, for lack of a better term that are particular in terms of reincarnation, of samsara, of cyclical existence. So these are these kind of three root problems that keep the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth going. And they are, comma, <laughs> there it is again, sensual desire, bahava, being, that's the second one. And the third is avidya, ignorance. Not understanding what's going on here is ignorance. And that is a big culprit in the perpetuation of the cycle. Confusion about the very nature of being, the very nature of bhava. And in other words, Clinging to being is one of the things that keeps the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth going. And then again, back to the first one, comma. I often say this about Buddhism. It's sort of one of my little things that I say. But in a lot of Indian traditions, reincarnation is explained by you kind of having a backlog of karma, like a backlog of retribution that you have performed all of this karmic action over your life or over lifetimes. And a general Indian view is that all of that karmic retribution has to play out. And so that the energy of that past karma is 
in some traditions, what propels you forward into your next life and a life after that and a life after that until all that karmic energy sort of peters out. That's what, again, a kind of normal Indian view is. From the Buddhist point of view, you keep coming back to reincarnate because you love it, <laughs> because you want more. You crave, and this is the first of the hindrance or the first of the taints, the desire for kama, for the kama datu. Again, one of the reasons why you keep coming back is because you want to. <laughs> so those are the taints. And I kind of want you to notice that the taints are like really low, like level base root stuff. And then there's all this like, you know, manifest level psychology of like anger and bitterness and fear and doubt. And, you know, a lot of these other things that we're talking about, but the taints are what's underneath all of that stuff. So, so now that we kind of have our quick review of the taints, the Buddha asks this question about why do you guys like why do you guys think of me that I haven't abandoned the taints? And so those three taints are what defile, they're what br bring renewal of being, they're what gives us trouble, they are what ripen into dukkha or suffering. And they are what lead to future birth, future aging, future death. And so the Buddha says, why do you guys think of me that I haven't destroyed the taints that lead to renewed existence? And you guys think because I haven't destroyed the taints that that's why I use things after reflecting, endure things, avoid things, and remove things. So that little part right there, if that sounds confusing, you can go back to sutta number two for the full review of this, but don't worry, I'm going to tell you what it is. But all of this information was given to us in that very important sutta number two on all the taints. But what we learn in there is that one who has gone forth from the home life into homelessness, there's a series of sort of practices that the Buddha prescribes. And among them are the practice of use only after reflecting. And what that is, is, is it talks about in, in Sutta number two on all the taints, it talks about how a basically a monastic should use their clothing, their you mean their robes, that use their bowl for begging, use their razor for shaving their head, like the use of the things of the world should it, it basically talks about how they should not basically consider it theirs. That it's sort of about reflecting on the use of things, but without ownership, without upadana in that way. So that's the idea of only kind of using the things of the world after careful reflection in that way. The second thing that's mentioned here about enduring one thing after reflecting, that's a whole section on basically Enduring the nonsense of this world, enduring the anger of this world, enduring the stupidity of this world, enduring it. If you were to ask me after reading, I went back and I reread Sutta number two this afternoon. And if you're familiar with the Paramita Kashanti, like the idea of patience or patient tolerance, the idea of this enduring is basically kashanti. It's that way of rather than get 
getting angry at people. It's keeping your cool. And again, the idea is enduring the nonsense of the world. <laughs> and I want you to notice that the first one about use, it's also about relating to the world, but in a certain way, in terms of how you use things. The second one is about how you relate to others and sort of, you know, uh, frustrating circumstances in that way. The third is avoiding another thing after reflecting. And if you read this section in the sutta number two, it basically talks about how a good monastic avoids falling in a pit, avoids stepping in a sewer, avoids charging elephants. <laughs> It basically is, a, is about avoiding and paying attention to what you're doing and avoiding um, avoiding trouble in that way. I have just enough time. I'll share a story about avoiding. All right. So this is a personal little anecdote about avo avoiding. So many, many, many years ago, before I lived in San Francisco, I was visiting San Francisco with a friend of mine. And we were in, eh, I think we were kind of in North Beach area, kind of North Beach heading down, like heading downtown way. And we were walking down this street. And so you can imagine the two of me and my friend walking. And up ahead, all of a sudden we heard, you know, out, outside of like a bar or something, the commotion of basically what would probably be some kind of fight. And as my friend and I were walking, the moment I heard commotion, whoop, I, I turned immediately around and started walking the other way. But my friend heard the commotion and was like, ooh, let's go see what's going on. And uh, we're not friends anymore, by the way, but, um, but that's beside the point. But I, it was interesting at that moment, the sort of the karma of going away versus the karma of curiosity and wanting to kind of get involved. I thought that was very interesting, but I do think that that's a moment of this idea of avoiding in that way. So at least from reading the sutra, it sounds like that's an example of it. And then the last one, and then we'll contextualize all this. The last of these sort of pra practices is this idea of removing another thing after reflecting. And I want to talk quickly about that idea of removing because it's kind of important. It's all important, of course, but the idea of removing what that is, and this is a big part of the practice, by the way. So I want to use the example, and I've been trying to use more diverse examples, but I want to use the example of like, of how, if you have any kind of addiction in that way, or any kind of um, out of control desire, let's put it that way. If you've suffered from that kind of lack of control or that kind of addiction, then you'll be very familiar with the phenomena of, you know, you're sort of doing whatever you're doing, going about your day in that way. And then there's that, ooh, a drink. That, that initial thought of like, that would be, you know, that would be enjoyable or that, you know, I want that. And again, it could be sexuality, it could be going to the arcade, it could be whatever it is, but we're noticing that very initial idea. And I think we all know that we are poss that this is possible, that we can do this. And what it is, is it's that upon that initial arising, thinking of something else, knowing that if I keep kind of dwelling on that, it's going to be hard for me to stop thinking about that. And then I'm eventually going to just do the thing that I'm thinking about doing. But if you can catch that initial rising of the desire and literally just 
That's what is being referred to as removing after reflecting. I don't want to make it sound easy because I know it's not easy, <laughs> but that is the practice. And what we just want to recognize is that it's so simple. It's the reality of if we keep entertaining that thought, it's going to be harder and harder to get rid of the thought. And again, then it'll eventually manifest into doing it. And so it's so important to be on top of your own mind, noticing just that initial stirring and literally putting your mind to something else and not allowing that idea to basically as a little, as a little weed to grow. And the Buddha talks about that, that your, that attention is water. And if you go to that little weed and start watering it with attention, it's going to grow into a plant. So that's sort of the, again, the lesson about enduring, or sorry, about removing. Now, what the Buddha is saying is, why do you guys think of me that I haven't, I basically that I'm not enlightened, that I haven't destroyed the taints. And that's why I use things mindfully. And that's why I, right? That's why I use things mindfully, endure things mindfully, avoid things mindfully, and remove things mindfully. But Aniruddha says, no, that's not what, that's not how we think of you. We think it's because you have destroyed the taints that you use things mindfully, endure things mindfully, avoid things mindfully, and remove things mindfully. For me, I really like, I love this little section of the sutra because I kind of am often talking about this idea that that a Buddha doesn't meditate to get enlightened. They meditate because they are enlightened. And this is sort of saying that same thing, that a Buddha is mindful of their use of things, but not as a practice to get rid of the taints, <laughs> as proof that they have gotten rid of the taints. That kind of makes sense to everybody, that little part of the sutta. Any questions or comments or ideas? All right. So there's a little bit more to go with that. So the Buddha says, in response to all of that that we just talked about, the Buddha says, good, good, Aniruddha. The Tathagata, meaning the Buddha, He's referring to himself. The Tathagata has abandoned the taints that defile, bring renewal of being, give trouble, ripen in suffering, and lead to future birth, aging, and death. He has cut them off at the root, made them like a palm stump, done away with them so that they are no longer subject to future arising. Just as a palm tree whose crown is cut off is incapable of further growth, so too, the Tathagata has abandoned the taints that defile and bring renewal of existence and all of that. He's cut them off at the root, made them like a palm stunt, done away with them so that they are no longer subject to future arising. So that's the conclusion of that part. And now to the kind of the third and final part. And this is the part that I was most interested in, actually, the, the why I really wanted to do this sutta tonight. This is some information that I've been looking for for a very long time. So the Buddha says to Aniruddha, what do you think, Aniruddha? What purpose does the Tathagata see that when a disciple has died, he declares that disciple's reappearance thus, so-and-so has been reborn in such and such a place, or so-and-so has reappeared in such and such a place. So the Buddha's talking about this thing that he does 
which is basically after disciples, after Buddhists, followers of the Buddha, members of the Sangha, after they pass away, the Buddha makes these public declarations of where they've been reborn. And he's saying, why do you think I do that? Aniruddha replies, venerable sir, our teachings are rooted in the Blessed One, guided by the Blessed One, have the Blessed One as their resort. It would be good if the Blessed One would explain the meaning of these words. Having heard it from the Blessed One, the bhikkhus will remember it. So Aniruddha wants to know, yeah, why, why do you do that? <laughs> so, Aniruddha. First of all, the Buddha says, it is not for the purpose of scheming to deceive people or for the purpose of flattering people or for the purpose of gain, honor, or renown or with the thought, let people know me thus. So it's not for any of those reasons that when a disciple has died, the Tathagata declares their reappearance thus, that so-and-so has reappeared in such and such a place, and that so-and-so has reappeared in such and such a place. Rather, it is because there are faithful clansmen inspired and gladdened by what is lofty, who when they hear that, direct their minds to such a state, and that leads to their welfare and happiness for a long time. All right, so I'm very curious how you all hear this, how you all understand what he's saying. Allow me to read more, but again, I'm curious to hear what everybody thinks is going on here. So here's the Buddha's example to, uh, to clarify what he's referring to. He's saying, so here, a, a living bhikkhu, so like one of you, so here a bhikkhu hears thus, the bhikkhu named so-and-so has died. The Blessed One has declared of him, he was an arahat. He was established in final knowledge. So he made it. He's an arahat. And he, meaning the bhikkhu who is still alive, who's hearing this, and he has either seen that venerable one for himself who has passed away, or he's heard of that venerable, he's heard of him said, the, the venerable one that passed away, that venerable one's virtue was thus. His state of concentration was thus. His wisdom was thus. His abiding in attainments was thus. His deliverance was thus. Recollecting his faith, virtue, learning, generosity, and wisdom. The living bhikkhu who heard all of this directs his mind to such a state. In this way, a bhikkhu has a comfortable abiding. All right, so I want to read the rest of this, but I want to make sure we're sort of all on the same page. So how did you all hear that? <laughs> What do we think this is being said here? Any thoughts? <laughs> well, the Buddha makes it clear, right? He's not doing this for money. <laughs> He's not doing it to impress people. He's not doing it to deceive people, right? What it sounds like to me... <laughs> is that he's doing it not for the deceased. He's doing it for the benefit of the living who might hear that person, the deceased person being praised. And then they would want to do that too. <laughs> very, very interesting. If you know what I mean. Like, I think it's a very interesting, call it upaya, for lack of a better term in that way. And it really is an upaya because it's about kind of getting this living bhikkhu to inspire him to, uh, what's the term? 
I love the 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 term. It's the um it's about those who are inspired and gladdened by what is lofty. It's what the Buddha says. He says, rather, the reason why I do all of this is because there are faithful clansmen inspired and gladdened by what is lofty, who when they hear these predictions of the deceased, right, then they direct their minds to such a state. And then that leads to the welfare and happiness for a long time. <clears throat> okay, so that's interesting. Allow me to kind of read the rest of this. So you can kick back for a little bit and allow me to read the rest of this. And then I want to discuss sort of the details that are going on in here. So you'll notice that the first, <clears throat> that the our example I just read, the Buddha's talking about a, a bhikkhu, so a, a male renunciant, a, a monk, who has, quote, or who was established in final knowledge. And that's the secret code language for being an arahat. And what we want to remember uh, kind of dharmically is that an arahat has no more rebirth. They've destroyed the taints. They've destroyed those things that are causing the rebirth cycle. So an arahat, but what the Buddha is saying is, is that He's predicting of that person. Oh yeah, that bhikkhu who died, they were an arhat. So they, they're not even being, what's being reborn. Somebody might hear that and be inspired to become an arhat. But then the Buddha goes on to say, and here a living bhikkhu hears thus. The bhikkhu named so-and-so has died. The Blessed One has declared of that bhikkhu, with the destruction of the five lower fetters, that bhikkhu has reappeared spontaneously in the pure abodes, and there he will attain final nirvana without ever returning from that world. And he has neither, and, he, and that living bhikkhu has either seen the deceased bhikkhu for himself, or he's heard about him, heard about his attainments, heard about all of his accomplishments, and then he directs his mind to that state. And in this way, too, a bhikkhu has a comfortable abiding. So this is a bhikkhu who is a once, or a non-returner, sorry, non-returner, up in this pure abode heaven where they'll finish the practice. And here, a living bhikkhu hears about bhikkhu named so-and-so who has died. And the Blessed One has declared of that bhikkhu with the destruction of the three lower fetters and with the attenuation of sensual desire, hate, and delusion, that bhikkhu has become a once-returner, returning once more to this world to make an end of suffering. And that living bhikkhu has either seen that venerable one or heard about all of his accomplishments, and he directs his mind to attaining such a state. In this way, too, a bhikkhu has a comfortable abiding. And then number four, here a bhikkhu hears thus. Bhikkhu named so-and-so has died. The Blessed One has declared of him with the destruction of the three lower fetters, he has become a shroto apanna, a stream enterer, no longer subject to hell realms, bound to eventually reach nirvana, headed for enlightenment. And the living bhikkhu has either seen that venerable one for himself or heard about all of his great accomplishments and he directs his mind to such a state and in this way, too, a bhikkhu has a comfortable abiding. Or a bhikkhuni, a female renunciant, or a nun, hears this. The bhikkhuni, the nun so-and-so, has died. The Blessed One has declared of her 
She was an arahat. She was established in final knowledge. And she has either, and meaning the living bhikkhuni, has either seen that sister for herself or heard it said of that sister, that sister's virtue was so, such, her state of concentration was thus, her wisdom was thus, her abiding in attainments was thus, her deliverance was thus. Recollecting that bhikkhuni's faith, her virtue, her learning, her generosity, and her wisdom, the living bhikkhuni directs her mind to such a state. And in this way, a bhikkhuni has a comfortable abiding. Or there's a bhikkhuni that hears that bhikkhuni named so-and-so has died, and the Blessed One has declared of her that with the destruction of the lower five fetters, she has reappeared spontaneously in the pure abodes and will there attain final nirvana without ever returning from that world. Or there's a bhikkhuni named so-and-so who has passed away, and the Buddha has declared of that bhikkhuni that with the destruction of the three lower fetters and with the attenuation of sensual desire, hate, and delusion, she has become a once-returner, returning only once more to this world in order to make an end of suffering. Or there's another bhikkhuni who has passed away, and the Buddha, the Blessed One, has declared of her that with the destruction of the three lower fetters, she has become a stream-enterer, no longer subject to perdition, the hell realms, bound for nirvana, headed for enlightenment. And a living bhikkhuni has either seen that sister for herself or heard about all of her accomplishments and directs her mind to such a state. In this way, too, a bhikkhuni has a comfortable abiding. Or, here, a lay male follower hears this. The male lay follower named so-and-so has passed away. The Blessed One has declared of that lay follower, with the destruction of the lower five fetters, they have reappeared spontaneously in the pure abodes, and will there attain final nirvana without ever returning from that world. Or there's a male lay person that the Buddha, that who has passed away and the Buddha has declared of them that with the destruction of the three fetters and with the attenuation of sensual desire, hatred, and delusion, they have become a once returner, returning once more to this world to make an end of suffering. And there's a lay male disciple who has passed away to whom the Buddha has declared that with the destruction of the three lower fetters, he's become a stream enterer no longer subject to hell realms, bound for deliverance, headed for enlightenment. And a living lay follower has either seen that venerable lay follower for themselves or heard it said of him, that venerable one's virtue was thus, their state of concentration was thus, their wisdom was thus, their abiding in attainments was thus, their deliverance was thus. Recollecting that lay person's faith, virtue, learning, generosity, and wisdom, the living lay male follower would direct their mind to such a state. And in this way, too, a male lay follower has a comfortable abiding. And finally, a female lay follower hears about a female lay follower named so-and-so who, who has passed away. And the Blessed One has declared of that lay female follower that with the destruction of the five lower fetters, she has reappeared spontaneously in the pure abodes and will there attain final nirvana without ever returning to the world. Or there's another female lay follower where the Buddha has declared that with the destruction of the three lower fetters and with the attenuation of sensual desire, hate, and delusion, she'll become a once returner, returning only once more to this world. And he has declared of another Lay female follower has passed away that with the destruction of the three fetters, she has become a stream enterer, no longer subject to the hell realms, bound for deliverance, headed for enlightenment. And our living lay female follower has either seen that sister for herself or heard it said of her, that sister's virtue was thus, her state of concentration was thus, 
Her wisdom was thus, her abiding in attainments was thus, her deliverance was thus. Recollecting her faith, virtue, learning, generosity, and wisdom, that living lay follower directs her mind to attaining such a state. And in this way, too, a female lay follower has a comfortable abiding. So, Aniruddha, it's not for the purpose of scheming to deceive people or for the purpose of flattering people or for the purpose of gain, honor, and renown. And it's not with the thought, let people know me thus, that when a disciple has died, the Tathagata declares their reappearance thus, saying, so-and-so has reappeared in such and such a state, so-and-so has reappeared in such and such a place. Rather, it is because there are faithful clansmen inspired and gladdened by what is lofty, who, when they hear that, direct their minds to attaining such a state, and that leads to their welfare and happiness for a long time. That's what the Blessed One said. The Venerable Aniruddha was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Okay. So, I want to kind of so this was the thing when I said at the beginning of the Dharma talk tonight that I've been looking for this sutra for a very long time. It's because I've been looking for some kind of context to the stream enterer, once returner, non-returner, arhat scheme. In particular, I've been curious like how these titles functioned. Was it, you know, people, were people running around saying, I'm an Arhat, or, you know, I'm a once returner, or like, and it would seem that this type of stuff was only after the person passed away, and the Buddha, with his great wisdom, his divine heavenly eye, at that point made this kind of determination that they had achieved the state of an arhat and they're not even coming back or they've cut off the five lower fetters and they're only going to that little heavenly abode and they're a non-returner or they've cut off the three fet lower fetters and so they have one more trip to do it <laughs> or they've cut off the three lower fetters and they have set at least seven more times around which by the way a stream enterer is traditionally said at most, you'll be reborn seven times. <laughs> but again, what it would seem like is that these are only uh, post-mortem in that sense. And that kind of does make sense because like, it would seem that anything before that would be premature in, in terms of like, if you got dubbed a once returner, but you could still meditate. You could still practice. And then next week you make it to non-returner. And then next month you made it to Arhat. So I kind of starting to think that nobody would be in their life declared a stream enterer, once returner, non-returner. But again, this is just my kind of speculating. But what, you know, again, I've been looking for a sutra to explain how were the early Buddhists using these terms? These, um, oh, and I do want to go a little deeper into all of this. And what I mean is, the Buddha talks about these categories, their, the, the person's faith, their virtue, their learning, their generosity, and their wisdom. And how that is explained is where the Buddha says that of the deceased, he declares that that venerable one's virtue was at this level. Their state of concentration was at this level. Their wisdom was this level. Their abiding in attainments was this level. And their deliverance was this level. So working backwards, 
the idea that the Buddha declares that their deliverance was such, well, the deliverance is the stream enterer, once returner, non-returner, or arhat. That is that those four fruits describe your level of liberation, your level of deliverance. So that's the last of those. Describing the person's abiding in attainments. In Buddhism, you kind of have to know the code language, the code words here. Attainments is always code for samadhi. And attainments and samadhi is always code for the formless jhanas. So infinite space, infinite consciousness, infinite nothingness, neither perception nor non-perception. So when the Buddha would recall the deceased practitioner's attainments, it would seem that it was at that point the Buddha would say, oh yeah, they had gotten into the ayatana of infinite space or infinite consciousness. That's how high they got or how deep they got in samadhi. Their wisdom was thus. That would be about vipassana, about insight. That would be about knowing the Four Noble Truths, knowing no self, knowing impermanence, kind of levels of insight and wisdom. And the Buddha would declare what level of insight or wisdom the person had acquired. State of concentration is more about jhana or dhyana in that idea of the more of the form concentrations in that sense. So when they talk about the second jhana as being a pleasure from concentration, not a pleasure from seclusion, but the second jhana, the third and the fourth are pleasure from concentration. That's what's being referred to there. And then a venerable one's level of virtue is their level of moral purity in that way. Were they completely pure of all the taints and fetters and bondage and all of that? Or were they a stream enterer and still had whatever virtue or lack of virtue in that way? So these, again, are all things that we hear a lot about. I hear a lot. I've read about them a lot. I've read suttas about them. And what I mean is, is that there's all of this talk in, in Buddhism about attainments, about deliverances, or these, uh, what they call the four fruits, fruit of a stream enterer, once returner, non-returner, and arhat. We hear about these things, but I've always been a little puzzled about how they functioned. Again, like, were they badges? Like, did you get the non-returner badge? From this sutta, it sounds like this is all, again, post-mortem. And not only that, the sutta seems to be saying that all of this isn't even about the person who is deceased. It was to inspire the living to achieve such a state in that way. And, you know, I didn't do it tonight. I purposely avoided it. I didn't want to get into the big conversation about reincarnation in Buddhism, that like that complicated conversation about if there's no self, what gets reincarnated and all of that. But I do want you to notice that here, if you read between the lines, like the, it, the Buddha kind of avoids actual reincarnation in that way, because he's kind of saying, yeah, what I'm saying about their re about their rebirths, I'm only saying it to inspire the living. I'm not actually maybe talking about them being reborn in wherever they're going to be reborn in that way. So any questions, comments, answers, or ideas about any of that, this post-mortem prediction stuff? Yeah, no. Um, so the difference between a stream enterer and a once returner is their relationship to the three poisons, right? The three fetters. 
one of the three fetters. Right. Green. So really quickly, and I didn't do it, so that we went over the five fetters a couple of Sundays ago. And the five fetters, there's a list of 10 fetters, by the way. Sorry, can I just interrupt for a sec? Yeah, of course. Because they, I thought that in both cases, it's the ending of the three fetters. But the difference between them is that there's a weakening of greed, hatred, or delusion, or there isn't a weakening of weak, greed, hatred, delusion. An, an attenuation, yes. Attenuation. Yes. Okay, that, that seems very... Um, subjective <laughs> that's all ah, that the it, like yeah they, they they you know they're they're pretty good about great hatred yep know. it all is but that seems especially so yeah and again this this is all and i didn't mention this i should have uh known but this is all kind of predicated on this idea that a, a buddha can like read people's minds and actually knows their mind better than they do that's like, yeah, that's the idea. So I, I would, I, on that level, I would say it's not supposed to be subjective. It's kind of supposed to be objective in that, in that sense, but yeah. Um, yeah, I didn't, sorry, no, I'm go ahead. No, I was going to say, I interrupted you, please. Oh yeah. I was just going to say that all we, I focused more on the taints this evening, but it, the sutta also keeps talking about the fetters. And I did just want to quickly mention that there is a the list of 10 fetters. And the idea is, is that an arahat has gotten rid of all the fetters, all 10. But if you want to make it as a non-returner, you have to at least get rid of what are called the lower five fetters. And the lower five fetters are, number one is this one very interesting one called the sat kaya drishti, the view or the opinion or the belief, the drishti in the true body, the sat kaya. And basically the sat kaya is this notion of the, the real me. Not this me, the real me. And that's a view it's wrong, it's a delusion, and it's a fetter to have this view of the true self or the true body. So the, that's the first fetter. The second fetter is doubt. The third fetter is an interesting one. It's actually about the belief in the efficacy of rites and rituals. But actually believing that rites and rituals do something is a fetter that has to be overcome. And then those, by the way, are the three lower, those are the three lower fetters. Kama, there it is again, sensual desire, and vipada, anger, are the next two. And those constitute the five lower fetters. And if you get rid of all of those, then you can make it to a non-returner status. Just the first three, you can be once returner, or you can be a, a stream enterer, depending upon your relationship with those other fetters. And then the idea is, is that up in the heavenly realms or whatever, you could get rid of the other five fetters, which I won't go into now because of time, but they are much more subtle fetters, like basically attachment to meditative states, attachment to formless meditative states. Interestingly, the next one is about conceit, kind of. So it's not the belief in the true self. It's just sort of the belief in a self at all. And then the last two are restlessness and ignorance. And it's very interesting that restlessness is still hanging around. It's like, a fe it's like one of the last things that an enlightened person gets rid of is kind of restlessness, so... Those are all the fetters, though. We made it through the sutta. Any remaining questions, comments, answers, or ideas? Oh, Robin, please. Thanks, Noam. Okay. Oh, okay. 
Yeah. Oh, thank you. Right. Yes. Um, do, do you think, do you see this as sort of um, intimating the beginning of how this, these um, people that have just died are being a benefit to others? And so you're starting to sort of see how, um, you know, intimating Bodhisattva a little bit um, so that, you know, they're by inspiring others. Uh, so your single practice, your solo practice becomes a benefit to others. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think that's a great insight into that, Robin, to, into how the sutta is sort of working in that way. Absolutely. Um, by the way, Robin, you totally reminded me, I really, I did want to say this. So if you are more familiar with Mahayana sutras, there's a very interesting corollary to this. And what it is, is, is that in the Mahayana tradition, because of the philosophy, because of the Dharma of that kind of teaching, they don't talk actually about stream entry once returner, non returner, or arhat. But what's interesting is, is that in the bodhisattva path, they have, um, it's called a vikarvanya, I believe. And what it is, is it's a quote, prediction of enlightenment. And it's also in sort of stages of realization. In particular, it's stages of realization of patience, the kashanti that I mentioned earlier. There are, in some, uh, in some lists I've seen, there's even four stages of development of patient tolerance. And the fourth final level is the patient tolerance for the birthlessness of all dharmas. And if you attain the patient tolerance of the birthlessness of all dharmas, the Buddha or a Buddha will give you the prediction that you will become a Buddha named so-and-so. And, -so. and you will be born in such and such a Buddha land called whatever your Buddha land is going to be called. And what's interesting is that there's a interesting mirroring of even what's going on in this sutra of these four fruits, the stream entry, once return, non return, arhat, and then the, a bodhisattva version. So, and what's interesting is I've had this theory for a long time that it is that the bodhisattva version is, is a response to this. And this sutra sort of helps explain that where the, it's the Buddha who's giving out these titles. Oh, you're a once return or non, -re or, you know, after you're, you've died in that way. So Anyways, I wanted to share that with everybody, a little Mahayana connection there. So thanks, Robin, for bringing up the Bodhisattva path and reminding me. All right, everybody, another sutta in the treasury. Oh, Maria, question, answer, idea. Yes, thank you. Um, so as usual, uh, I think doubt always wants to jump out at me. And I'm wondering if, like, how, how doubt in this context functions as a fetter. And uh, just about what exactly kind of doubt we're talking about here. Like yep. doubt in what? I'm so glad you asked that question. Um, ah, so in order to answer that, let's go back quickly. I want to go back to that section. If you have this, the, uh, the wisdom version, I'm talking about, uh, paragraph slash section seven. And it's the one where the Buddha says, um, it's, it, it's where the Buddha says like, uh, about, you guys think, why do you guys think I haven't abandoned the taints? And that's why I do the practice. And Aniruddha says, no, it's because we know you've abandoned the taints that you do the practice. So I want to quickly mention this. And it's about the very idea of 
and I was trying to find like the a really good language. So I, I won't I won't bother trying to find the exact language. I'll use my own language. But it's about this idea that you take anything, like I've been mentioning, comma, the sensual desire, it can be addiction, it could be whatever, you know, whatever. But in the world of Buddhism, we're talking about, they're talking about the complete elimination of anger, anxiety, stress, fear, all of that. They're talking about a system that leads to the complete removal of that. Now, I've had a lot of experience, Maria, in, in my teaching, where I have noticed, just in some students, just in conversation, nothing serious, but I've noticed a certain doubt that that's even possible. No, the, the, the trauma or the addiction will always be in there somewhere, is what I hear. Like, you can kind of get it under control, you can, you know, whatever, but the idea of complete eradication, that's the Dharma, that's what we're doing here, and I want you to notice that if you don't think it's possible to completely eradicate these things, it's going to be very hard to eradicate these things. <laughs> so doubt is very problematic there. Whereas, now we're not talking about blind faith, of course not. But what we are talking about is a kind of understanding of the Dharma to where you're like, Oh, I see what's causing this. And I see that if I stop doing that, it'll stop. It, I'm not there yet, but I see, like, I see the mechanism. I see what's causing it. And I see, oh, and at that point, you can have certainty or faith, for lack of a better term, that that's, that this is where the path leads. And if you have that certainty or that faith, that is one of, that's a virtue that can lead you to that very goal. So that's for me, the hang up of doubt is that kind of like, I've even heard this idea, you know, that people, enlightenment isn't possible, that I really doubt that that's something. <laughs> and it's like, if that's really your belief, then go play racquetball or do something else, because the whole point of this is about the possibility of, of enlightenment. So that's my two cents on doubt. Oh, sorry. Oh, you got it. You got it. Oh yeah. I just wanted to add that. I, I think it's interesting too, to look at the flip side of that and consider how wholesome doubt functions. And, you know, there has to be this certain amount of questioning to get us on the path in the first place. Ah, but on that note, Maria, you, you really, you jog something in me that I really want to stress. Mm -hmm. I want you to notice how certain doubt is. There's a certain like stubbornness to it. And what I mean is it's good to question. It's good to be skeptical. It's good to investigate. But to actually have doubt is a kind of form of certainty, which is funny because doubt is about not being certain. <laughs> if you see what I mean. So doubt is a very particular kind of thing. And I wouldn't want it to get it confused with things like inquiry, discernment, like, you know, we need to be careful in that way. So I hope that makes sense, that idea. Yeah, um, I guess it certainly makes sense. And um, I think 
maybe what I was thinking about is, you know, doubting uh, the line of bullshit that we've been fed uh, growing up or oh, things like that. Right. And yeah. again, for me, that would be questioning, right. uh, investigating a lot of other verbs. Right. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah. Well. All right, everybody. Then that'll be another Dharma Doors. Um, I'll be back here next Sunday with another sutta. Not sure which one yet, but we'll find out.